and you put. And then this thing needs to stay on. Alright. Action. Alright. So this is our interview today. Um, let me bring this picture of me up a little bit. That is me. <laughs> okay. So um, thanks for doing this interview with me, Manny. Um, I'm in Chicago and you're in New Zealand. And thanks to the internet, we can do this. So let's get started. Um, the first question I want to start with is a pretty heavy question. It could be. Um, what was the happiest moment of your life? Well, when, you know, and the questions are lovely, and I was thinking about it. So there's many, and, and, you know, that's such a change, thinking about the happy things. But So I'll start in... Chronology. So the first really amazing happy memory I have, I, I grew up on a farm and um, when I was little the farm still didn't have any mechanical equipment on it so my dad was had horses and so my first memory is I'm riding on the horse with my dad, I'm really little, I'm probably only two, maybe two and a half. And I'm sitting on the saddle and I'm snuggled up against him and he used to wear sort of quite rough prickly clothes and I'm, I can hear his heart beating in my ear and my dad smoked roll your owns and in the old days tobacco, not like now, it used to smell really nice like a herbal sweet smell and I can smell that so I'm on the horse with my dad, I'm cuddled up against him, we're out on the farm somewhere. Wow. That's a good memory. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful memory. And it's filled with, like, sense as well and visual. Yeah. Um, yeah. So shifting gears, uh, what is the saddest memory you remember having? Yeah, I, I thought about that and it just, it, it came in really hard. The saddest one for me is the morning that Max Beck died. Max, um, some people won't know, was an amazing intersex person that I met at the first retreat and Max and I did a lot of work together because um, you know in those early days we didn't have language we didn't have very much gentleness we didn't have very much spirit and in, in this journey of being an intersex person and a lot of what I know and what I learned and the fun I had with Max and um, we became really close friends, which is kind of crazy given that we live half a world away from each other. Um, and Max died of the complications of a strange kind of cancer that was really related to his intersex condition and the fact that he was living as a guy and the sort of treatment that he needed was female treatment and it's all a bit devastating really and yeah that's the saddest day of my life bless you Max um thanks for sharing that with me uh um I guess this is so somewhat of a transition but um who was the biggest influence on your life Manny or one of the I, biggest influences yeah yeah that was a hard one to think about so I go back to the transition really and things in my very early 40s had got pretty bleak and horrible and I was thinking a lot about taking my own life I had for most of my life but things were getting right up at the sharp end and a friend of mine introduced me to uh, an amazing doctor Dr. Hedy Rodenberg and Hedy had been trained by the Swiss um, psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler Ross, and so you know, I didn't have language, I didn't even have the term intersex when I first went to see Hedy. I, I didn't really know what was going on, and she is an extraordinary person, she's still alive, she doesn't um, have her medical practice anymore. And the first time I went to see Hedy, as you know, most doctors see you for 10 minutes. She saw me for an hour and a half, and she was warm and generous and kind and all the things that doctors hadn't been. And she would tell me years later, she didn't know anything about intersex herself. 
she hadn't been taught anything about it, no surprise in that. But she was just there. She could see my pain. Um, she said that she would work with me and, um, you know, find the answers, and she did. And it was Hetty who suggested that I might like to think about doing my own personal work by going to a retreat. And in those days, I was really hard assed and um, very armoured and thought that things like therapy were just fucking crap. You know, I thought you did that when you were um, mental and I didn't, well, I was terrified maybe I was. It's really hard to think about now. So thanks to Hetty, I um, did about a year later go off to my first retreat and that's really the beginning of what changed my life. So high fives to Hetty Rodenberg. High fives. <laughs> <laughs> so you said she's not practicing anymore? No, I see her occasionally and um, it's always lovely to see her. Um, she's in her late 70s now. She's not a young person anymore. Did she end up like writing stuff about intersex things in medical journals or just kind of just no, had a relationship with you? Yeah, she didn't. She, her main focus is helping people with um, very severe trauma and people who are in the, you know, the end of their life with, with life-threatening illness. She's written about that, but not intersex per se. Cool. Um, well... What are the most important lessons you've learned in your life thus far? I had a bit of a, a list, um, and there's probably more, but we'll just go with, with the ones I wrote down. So the first one, being different is okay. You know, I and I, I and I wouldn't have even languaged it, but I I grew up knowing, knowing, <laughs> knowing, <laughs> knowing that there was something in terms of the way society looks at it, profoundly wrong with me. You know, so wrong you couldn't talk about it, so wrong that I kept having to have bits chopped off my body to make it okay. And I internalized that. And, you know, I I did. I, I thought that I was a monster. And reaching that place where getting the words, um, relocating myself in my body because I wasn't even... You know, I used to joke and say I was a head that towed my body around. That's not really a very funny joke looking back. So getting to that point where, you know, yeah, I have this very different body and this very different reality, and it's, it's okay. It's fucking okay. So that's one. Okay. Um, number two, change is possible. You know, here we are talking, you know, and I've met you in Chicago, and how amazing was that? And when I think about the change that's occurred in the last 20 years, some things haven't moved as fast as I want them to. But if you look at the totality of what's been achieved in 20 years, you know, as I look out, what are we going to do in the next 20 years? You know, real change is happening. So change is possible. My number three, laughter is a powerful medicine. My dad had a silly wacky sense of humor and all of us as children have inherited that and I didn't laugh for a lot of my life but refinding my humor and um, just that part of being able to stand and look at things and laugh about it um, is very very powerful and it's not there for everybody so it, it's been one of my lessons so a gentleness and laughter um, number four, the magic of dance. One, one of the ways that I relocated myself and my body, and it was accidentally, was, was refining. Because as a little kid, I loved dancing, but um, I stopped doing it because I couldn't dance properly. And also, dance requires you to be in your body. So the dance I do is, is free dance. It's not a particular dance. It's just moving to music and... I still do it. Sometimes I forget to do it, and it's the it's the best way for me to bring myself back in my body and anchor myself, and yeah, just be there. So that's dance, and the last one, and to you, the importance of friends. Mm. 
and probably with that I'd go the importance of friends slash love. Um, you know, I've I've found not physical loving that has that hasn't been in my life, but intimacy of extraordinary, complex friendships in the last twenty years have been remarkable and wonderful. I d- I didn't think any of that was possible. Thank you. There's so many lessons in that in those four <laughs> points. Um. This is not a question on the list, but it's something I was just thinking about. You, you've you brought up your dad twice now. Um, and do you have any... Was it hard to... Or it sounds like you have good memories of your father. And I was just wondering if you have any... Um, any negative feelings associated with your father in terms of... I don't know if it was his choice or whatever, but in terms of surgeries or things that may have been done to you or have you kind of let that go or where are you at with that? Yeah, I mean, I used to be full of rage and anger towards my parents, um, particularly in the early stages of doing my work. And, you know, I stand in a very different place now. I've I've learned a lot about my parents. Um, They both had quite hard lives. And I realize, I mean, they were country people, they were farmers, they were very conservative, they absolutely did want the best for me. Um, They would be, because my dad's been dead for 30 years, they would be horrified to realize um, what happened to me. So, yeah, I used the word let go. I've I've let go that anger a long time ago. Um, My sadness is that as I say, Dad died 30 years ago, and, and we we had a, a, a very strong connection, but we'd never really sat down and talk. I didn't know then how to talk to my parents, and they, poor things, didn't know how to talk to me. They absolutely didn't. Um, so jumping gears again, uh, what is your earliest memory, Manny? Yeah, but, you know, it, it's interesting. It's, um, as I said before, The farmhouse that I grew up in, just for the first few years, had no electricity. So it's lying on my cot and looking up at the ceiling, and there would have been a lantern hanging on a hook. And so I'm watching the the flame pattern dancing on the ceiling, and I can hear the voices of my parents who would have been through in the kitchen talking. And that's quite a strong memory, so I don't know how little I am. I'm in a cot, so I'm imagining I am very little, but that's my earliest memory. It's a good one. Cool. Um, staying on memories, if you could hold on to one memory from your life for eternity, uh, what, what would that be? You know, this was a really challenging question, and I walked around in my my memory files sort of pulling open and I it struck me that the most powerful memory that I have if I was only allowed to keep one is the last breakfast at that first intercepts retreat in California and you know so we've all had three days together just the most incredible time you know for many of us it was the first time we'd met other intersex people um, you know, I think I thought that was possible, and we'd done lots of laughing and lots of crying together, and here we are, this extraordinary energy, and um, it was the last breakfast, and as I say, there was lots of laughter and lots of crying, and I remember Peter suddenly got really upset and said, and, and we were talking about what was going on, she said, I shouldn't even be here, you know, you guys have had such terrible things happen to you and you know I haven't had surgery and I just remember through my own tears turning around and saying you know you've brought a really amazing gift to me because I had for the first time an idea of what my body would have been like if I hadn't had surgery you know and nobody else could have given me that nobody and yeah there was a lot of magic going on that morning so that's that's the one memory that I'd keep Excellent. Um, I, I am, I'm hearing a little bit of interference with the microphone, but it's just, it's minimal. I just started to hear it. Okay, great. I'll just, I'll just move it a little bit further. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, so, 
uh, we're we're like we're starting something new, you know, interact youth activists, and I guess this question is really relevant for what we're doing since we're kind of interviewing uh, the, the first wave intersex people to walk the earth, <laughs> not first ever, but the activists, I suppose, and um, so my question would be: Are there any words of wisdom you you could pass along to to me or any of us? that are also intersex and maybe a little bit younger and hopefully going to be following in some of your footsteps and others like you? Yeah, I, I wouldn't presume to um, tell you guys how to do it because I think the second wave will have its own energy. But I, I think those things that I've talked about, you know, having a sense of humour, believing that change is possible, um, enjoying each other's company, so um, making sure there's lots of laughter and just really going out there. I mean, we are not monsters, and you know, some of the most wonderful people I've met on planet Earth are intersex people, and we still need to tear this medical model to pieces that continues to try and push people into this gender binary and say that bodies that are different are not okay. Like, it's it's absolutely primal. I, I've thought a lot about what's going on on planet Earth, and there's two things that, that could end human existence, and one is environmental pollution and degradation, um, global warming and running out of fuels and things like that. And the other is humans are really different and we have to figure out how to do that on planet earth how to live with grace and gentleness with all that difference and i feel like intersex people are the canary in the cage i mean we're we're an example within families that say you have to deal with this and you're not dealing with it very appropriately at the moment so i think intersex people have the potential to teach everybody on planet earth how to do this that's cool. That's what that's what you guys are doing. Yeah. Um. Uh. Well, what are you proudest of in your life, Manny? Hmm. You know, I thought about it, and I thought one of the the things, the fact that I'm here, and and uh, I mean, in saying that, you know, I didn't particularly do anything myself because, as I said, I was very suicidal for large parts of my life. Um, and I'm just, I'm glad that I'm still here, so being here. I'm coming back from the first retreat and starting the Intersex Trust here in New Zealand, um, which is still going. So I think we were one of the, the first, maybe the first registered charity for intersex issues, and we're still going. Um, I think the the television documentary that I was part of that was called Mani's Story, you know, which has been shown all around the world. I'm really proud of that. Um, I, I don't know if you know, but the city of San Francisco gave me a civic award for my activism and the making of, of Mani's Story, um, which was wonderful. Um, being involved in the Assume Nothing project, which is a photography book, and it's been an art, art exhibition and went on to be made into a um, full-length feature film. is something I'm really proud of. We're in the final stages of cutting a new documentary about um, intersex issues. You probably don't even know this. But one of my friends here in Wellington donated money so that we're going to have a long version of the, the film that will be available for film festivals. Oh my god, so, I love that. <laughs> yeah, in a couple of weeks I'm going up to Auckland to cut the new voiceover for that. So, you know, I'm really excited about that. And I, I'm very proud of, you know, the, the, the fact that that will be done um, and the generosity of someone who's put the money up so that that can happen. And then finally, and again, you won't know this, um, we've just at the end of last year received a substantial grant um, from 
a charity here in New Zealand, and I mean substantial, nearly um, $100,000 a year for three years that will enable me to do this work, so to go out and speak as an educator, as a change agent. I, I didn't know that. No, no. <laughs> It just, it, just, it just happened before the end of the year and there was a lot of work involved and I got myself way exhausted and I've been, I've been sick and not very well so um, I hadn't even got round to telling everybody about it so you might be the first person to know in, in America so that's good. Awesome. So you know we, we will be able to carry on our work together and think about how, how we might do that, how we might dance together. Yeah. Um, if if you had a if you had a voice or if you had a if you were able to mold this and how would you want to be remembered? Um, you know, it's it's not something that I set out to do to have some great memory of myself, but I think. The reality is I was the first person to speak out in New Zealand, so I, I would feel comfortable if that's how I was remembered. You know, the first person who dared to be visible, and I did that knowing that that was the issue, that it was this invisibility and the, the message that I'd been given as a child that who I was was not okay. That, that did terrible damage. It did terrible damage to me to my family, to the community that I grew up in. So being visible is, is really, really important. It was interesting, preparing for this last night, I was just sitting looking at my library and I, I got the book out on, on Harvey Milk and I was just flicking through the pages and you know, there's another hero of, of somebody in the, that early wave of gay rights who just went, no, I'm going to be visible. I'm going to be out as a gay man. Now, when you say visible, that was one of the first things that struck me about you. Um, I, had only, I had only heard your voice before you came to Chicago. And it's, it's pretty... I had a pretty direct visual of what I thought you were going to look like. And then I saw you. <laughs> and you know you have a little bit of chin hair going on. And like a... I don't know if it's butch, but you have shorter hair and like color in it and a cool outfit and but it didn't match the voice that I that I thought and, and I think in the documentary as well you, you mentioned I mean the, the newest documentary, um, Intersections, you mentioned just being visible and I was wondering were you visible were you living out as a hermaphrodite and visible in that way before the conference or not the conference, but the get together in I think California, um, or was no, it kind I, of after? Uh, um, I just started to come out with the people that I knew, and in those days I was pretty pretty isolated. So I don't know if we're gonna I'll come up because I've worn this deliberately. So oh, I see it now. Yeah. No, this is the original hermaphrodites with attitude T-shirt, and I'm I'm remembering. The first day I wore it downtown, and it's really weird because the lettering, as you can see, is tiny. And I was kind of, I wanted to go, go down going, yes, I'm a hermaphrodite and I'm proud. But I was also terrified. Like, my whole childhood experience had been if people knew that I was intersex or the word that was used when I was little was hermaphrodite you know people were going to rape me people were going to hurt me so it was this strange mixture of pride and excitement and terror and my coming up my being visible and, and the facial hair was part of that was was a hugely personally powerful thing to do and yeah, I have not gone back into the closet and never will. That's awesome. Um, I think we have two more questions, and the last, second to last one is, do you have any regrets? No, I don't. I, I There was a, a lot of my life where I was very regretful, and, you know, I can look back and think of all the lost years and the things that I didn't do and the things that I didn't know, 
and part of my journey and part of what I've chosen to do myself is not to live with regret. The past is the past. I can't change it. I can change how I carry it. But the part that I'm in control is the here and now. And so I've become very now and very future focused. The past is just what it is. Speaking of I can learn from it, I can, you know, think and reflect on it, but I don't sit there and regret. Speaking of the future, what does the future hold for you, Manny? Oh, it's whatever I want to make out of it. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that I've learned. Like, um, if I'd sat there and, and said, you know, 10, 20 years ago, I'll be involved in making three feature films, I'll be on television, you know, I'll travel to America. I mean, this recent trip going to California, going to California, going to Brussels to the world's first ever gathering of intersex professionals, you know, sitting in a little cafe, laughing and having fritz and beers with Jim Bruce. I mean, I would not have thought that was possible, but it's happened, you know, so we can make it whatever we want to. And if we work together and we support each other and we have fun, yeah, we can do whatever we want. I believe that. Cool. Well, you're one of my greatest inspirations, Manny. So thank you for doing this interview and I can't wait for other people to see it and hear it. And, and I really think it's important. Like everything you've said, I feel like, I feel like it's history in the making in a way this interview and, and all your other interviews too thank you mm -hmm. well you guys rock and it's just you know the place we've got to is wonderful and yeah let's just carry it on yeah and you know I'm, I'm not going away I haven't retired yet I'm not ready for my rocking chair so as I said there I, I think um, the fact that I was involved by accident in the first wave and I'm still around and involved in the second wave that's, that's wonderful it's an incredible honor. Cool. Well, um, I wanted to end by telling you, I, I don't know if you know, but I want a trip to anywhere in the world. And um, I think I'm going to come to New Zealand. So uh, maybe I can actually see you again in your own land. <laughs> Cause you That's wonderful. I knew you were coming to Australia, so if you're able to jump across the ditch, which is what we call the piece of water between Australia and New Zealand, that would be so wonderful. It would be wonderful to see you here. Yeah, I, I, th I thought I was going to Australia too, but I think I'm going to actually just focus on New Zealand and make Australia secondary. Um, okay. But I, I didn't th know that. I didn't know that you'd want a trip, so that's... That's wonderful. So we'll have to work out when that might happen and make sure that I'm here when you're here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it'll be... So you got here and I was somewhere else. Yeah, well, I'll be there for a while, so hopefully we'll be able to cross paths at one point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let's talk some more about, you know, um, if, if you're picking one place, like what it is that you want and whether New Zealand or Australia would, would give you the most opportunity. Okay. To do what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, all I really want to do is visit you. Um, you told me about your land like a long time ago when you were in Chicago. You said you lived on some land, and I do you still live there? No, I'm. I hmm. live in a little tiny, tiny, tiny house in, in, in a on top of a garage in the city. So, no, I I grew up in rural New Zealand, but that's not where I live at the moment. So, well, I still want to see you. And then I have another friend that I met um, traveling in Italy a long, long time ago. And he's from Christchurch, I think. And um, I want to see him. And then there's another intersex person that used to live in Chicago um, that lives in New back. They're from New Zealand, so they're back there. And um, I messaged these boys from a video I saw yesterday about mountain biking in New Zealand. They took a helicopter up to a mountain and they rode down. And that's yeah. always been my dream. Like... Because I went on a bike trip to Detroit, and there's a lot of hills. And I was like, I want to design a city that's only that has lifts for bicycles, and then you just ride downhill to get everywhere. And I guess that's what you can do in New Zealand. And I wrote them an email yesterday, and they already wrote back, and they said that they would take me for two ride, uh, one or two rides. And um, 
So I just kind of want to see New Zealand, and I figure I would never be able to afford to go there ever. So I might as well use the free ticket to go to the most expensive place I could think of in terms of a flight. And yeah. Okay, well, if you if you get yourself down here, I I my mountain biking days are long gone, but I have friends who do that, so we could absolutely make sure that you could do some awesome mountain biking things here. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's been good talking to you. It's been just wonderful. You, you were awesome. I would be so bad at these questions. I would have. I don't. I don't think I have any answers for like half of them. So, you're amazing. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, in my previous life, as as you probably know, I had this weird job in civil defense, and I did lots of um, media training, which is just come and really, really useful in this part of my life. <laughs> All right, Manny, I'll talk to you later. I, I love you and thank you. I love you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>